You said you can work the graveyard shift, that's why we hired you, Daryl was filling out a stack of paperwork as his supervisor, Malcolm, spoke to him from behind his desk. Today was Daryl's first day at his new job. Daryl had just been fired from his previous security job for suspected theft and hadn't had the luxury of being choosy about his next position. But this nearly deserted hospital on the far side of the bridge, in a part of the city that he would have never visited otherwise, had been willing to hire him right away. An employment agency had connected Daryl with Malcolm earlier in the week. Yesterday, Malcolm asked Daryl over the phone to report to work in the early evening instead of at midnight so he'd have time to fill out the required forms and go over his duties. Malcolm had told Daryl that he had never been in the hospital building during the late night shift, but that everyone who worked the shift reported to him. It's such a hard vacancy to fill. Well, that's everything. Just sign here and here. You'll get your first paycheck mailed to the address on file, in about two weeks, Malcolm tried to smile pleasantly as he watched Daryl complete the final form, but it was late, and he wanted to be at home. Thank you, sir. I'm just glad to be here, Daryl said with a modicum of sincerity. I'm sure that we'll have a good working relationship, Malcolm rested his folded hands over his conspicuous paunch, not saying anything but still smiling. Okay, you can grab some dinner across the street at, uh, Melvin's. Everybody who works late eats there, including the nurses Malcolm's smile faded. But we don't want any trouble with them, you hear me. Uh, yes, sir. I'll keep my hands to myself, Sir Darrell reassured his new boss, putting his pen back into his shirt pocket. That's good. It's good. If you work the graveyard shift, you won't see many of them anyway. Besides, most of the pretty ones work during the day. The point is, don't get too friendly with the nurses. Malcolm stood and shook Daryl's hand, walking around his desk to see him out of his office. At least an hour before midnight, take the elevator to the 13th floor, Malcolm reminded him. I'll look for Reggie and take over for him once he shows you the ropes. Otherwise, your shift starts at midnight every night that you're scheduled, unless I say different. I won't see you again for another few weeks, not until our monthly staff meeting on the last Thursday of the month. Walking through one of the hospital's revolving turnstiles, Daryl exited onto the busy street. It was a warm summer evening, and he watched a hazy orange sun drift over the tops of the tall buildings on the borough's far side. Daryl missed his hometown upstate, but he was excited to have moved to the city and eagerly anticipated the opportunities he believed it would eventually offer him. Would he gain fame one day as an actor? This was his hope. Daryl explored the city blocks and then ate his dinner at Melvin's. Leaving the restaurant, he sprinted across the street to the hospital's main building, its floors now lit against the backdrop of the nighttime city. Daryl narrowly dodged the oncoming traffic, coming close to a speeding taxi. Reaching the hospital, he paused at the corner. The corner was different from its companion at the hospital's front. It too was inlaid with gray bricks, but there was a dedication plaque, likely to a donor or the hospital's founder. Examining the dedication, Daryl noted the hospital's name and date, late in the last century. There was also a man's name, Nathaniel Wingett. The dedication under Wingett's name read for our lives eternal, there was a circle in each of the plaque's four corners, and within each was an ornate symbol and letters too small for Daryl to easily decipher. Daryl walked through the hospital lobby and took the elevator to the 13th floor. A bell chimed as the elevator doors opened, allowing him a view of the floor's reception desk Daryl greeted the nurse on duty as he approached and asked for Reggie, indicating that he was the new midnight shift guard. Reggie's finishing his rounds. He should be back soon, the nurse replied affably. But there's still hours to go in his shift. Aren't you early, the nurse seemed perplexed, that anyone would want to get a head start on the graveyard shift, especially on the cancer and hospice floor. Daryl inhaled the faint smell of death, 
an odor even the antiseptic couldn't hide. Yeah, but I didn't want to spend it in the downstairs lobby. Malcolm said I should show up here early if I wanted to. Daryl looked around and saw that there was still staff wandering the halls. He knew almost all of them would leave before the beginning of his shift. Suit yourself. You can wait in the nurse's lounge down the hall until Reggie circles back. I made fresh coffee only an hour ago. The nurse gave a tight smile and turned back to the magazine that she had previously been engrossed in. The walls of the hospital looked worn and tired, as if every place Daryl had gone desperately needed a fresh coat of paint. The doors to the patient rooms were also shabby, with black adhesive tape placed over the odd inset window. Daryl wondered if anywhere in the hospital had been renovated recently. He stopped at a wide picture window further down the hallway and peered out over the city. High-rises blocked most of the view of the bay, but Daryl could still see the body of water and a small island in the distance. The 13th floor was the hospital's top floor, and according to Malcolm, it would soon be nearly deserted. Daryl pushed open the door to the lounge and found two nurses in conversation, foam coffee cups in hand. The women turned as Daryl entered. Oh, you, the new hire the younger nurse asked, emptying her cup and tossing it in the waste bin near the metal sink. Um, yes, ma, I am. Today's my first day on the night shift. I'm going to meet Reggie soon, Daryl tried to be polite, but the women seemed to be in on a joke that he wasn't aware of. The older nurse wore a sly grin as she replied to him. Well, good luck with that. Not many can handle the graveyard shift up here. Most quit after some months, and even a few weeks. Some of the nurses think there's something off about the floor. The younger nurse was smirking now, as if unable to believe that anyone would be foolish enough to take this job. You don't say. You mean like the floor is haunted or something Daryl didn't believe in the supernatural. But he noticed the nurses seemed serious, even convinced. Can't say the nurse replied. No one except the late night guard shift ever sees anything. The guys sometimes complain that they see or hear things at night since I've been here. A few guards have just up and left without warning, punch out at the end of their shifts and don't show back up to work the next day. Some don't even bother to call the nurses exchange glances and then walked past Daryl, not bothering to make any pleasantries as they exited the room. Daryl stood alone in the lounge, thinking back to the phone call with Malcolm. Malcolm had asked some personal questions if he was married and if he had family in the city. No, Daryl told him. He was single and his parents weren't from around here. He had only arrived months ago from upstate. Hearing this, Malcolm had offered him the job. Returning to the reception desk with a cup of coffee, Daryl found a man wearing a blue security guard uniform chatting to the nurse that he had spoken to earlier. The man turned and seemed to recognize Daryl, offering his hand in greeting as Daryl approached. Daryl, the man said, giving him a firm handshake. I'm Reggie. I work the evening shift on this floor, and I have for years. Malcolm said that you're a country boy from upstate. Perturbed by the question, Daryl replied, No, I'm just from upstate, not the countryside. Slapping Daryl's shoulder, Reggie said, Well, if it ain't here, it might as well be the country Reggie gave a hearty laugh, amused by his own joke. Come on, I'll show you the lockers downstairs and get you in your new uniform. Reggie and Daryl took the elevator to the basement level and then they made their way down a narrow hallway to a locker room used by the hospital staff. Daryl could hear the building's furnace working in a room not far from the lockers. Oh, that? That's the old furnace, Reggie said, noticing Daryl's distractedness. Morgue's down here too. The orderlies bring the bodies to the morgue and medical waste is disposed of in that their furnace. I don't like to stay down here for too long the air, just it ain't right. 
Reggie handed Daryl a hospital guard uniform from an empty locker and then told him that the locker was his. He then gave him a set of keys and a heavy flashlight, saying that he might need to enter a locked room during the night or that there could be a sudden power outage. Lights on the floor ain't so good. Once changed, you'll go upstairs and I'll give you the tour. While you do that, I'll need to use the commode. Reggie chuckled as he exited the locker room. The darkened hospital hallways were so poorly lit that Daryl was forced to use his flashlight to see ahead of him. The nurse that Daryl had met on the 13th floor earlier had already left. All of the other medical staff had exited as well. As Daryl walked the floor, he could still see some of the patients asleep in their rooms. A few of the patients seemed to be breathing heavily, and he heard a distant moan. Daryl wasn't a fan of hospitals, not because he disliked being near the ill, but because of the equipment that kept patients alive. He didn't know what half of the machines even did, though they all made him uneasy. He felt out of place on the cancer floor and remembered the nurse's foreboding words about those who had quit the graveyard shift after only a short time. Reggie Darrell called, realizing that he had already lost sight of his new partner. Reggie was crouched over, fumbling with a key that he had pulled from his belt. He unlocked a wooden door and stood aside as Daryl approached. In here, Reggie said. Daryl entered the room, only to find a medical supply closet filled with gauze, bandages, alcohol pads, patient gowns, and a cot. Reggie walked over to the cot and patted it with one hand. This is where I sometimes take a nap when it's really late. The nurses never come in here. Daryl looked over the cot, noting its stains before replying, you sleep in here, Reggie? Man, it looks filthy. You sure this is sanitary? I don't stay here long, Reggie said defensively. It beats working in a chair all night. Some of the rooms on this floor are empty, too. They keep the extra patients on the floors below us. I think they used to keep more patients up here years ago. But most of this floor is shut down now. The cancer wards almost moved to a newer building. It was supposed to happen years ago, but they just ain't got around to it yet. They're moving the old folks to that building, too. Reggie scratched his head then pulled his handkerchief from his pocket to wipe his brow. You mean the hospice patients, Daryl asked, still standing in the doorway. He was trying to remember all the details Malcolm had given him, and he knew that patients on this floor would need more attention than anyone else in the building. Yeah, the hospice patients, Reggie replied. They're gonna need a lot more medical attention, and some just ain't gonna make it to the move. Others can't get around at all. If you hear moaning, it's just one of them, probably near death. Even their family won't be here this late. This comment made Daryl nervous, but he tried to maintain his composure. You ever been with someone as they passed? Reggie Daryl asked. Nah, I ain't a nurse. It's just my job to call one if I think a patient's about to go, Reggie replied. I've seen a few near the end, though, if that's what you mean. Did you know them? Reggie exhaled loudly. Well, I didn't know them well, but I remember them. When you see someone struggling to breathe for a while, you don't forget it. Yeah, that must be tough, Daryl replied, looking into the dim hallway beyond the door. Look, don't worry. You'll get used to it. You may not know who's in what room now, but by the end of the week, you won't be able to forget them Reggie noticed the time on his watch and cleared his throat before telling Daryl that his shift was nearly over. They both walked back down the hallway toward the elevators. Daryl could still hear that same distant moaning as they reached the floor's entrance. He was curious and decided to investigate. He opened a few doors to nearby rooms, but none of the patients inside was responsible for the noise. What are you doing, Reggie asked from behind. Daryl turned to find Reggie watching him, 
seemingly agitated. Reggie quickly walked over and slammed the door that Daryl had been holding open. I heard something. I just wanted to check if anyone was in trouble, Daryl said, puzzled by Reggie's reaction. You're hearing things. Look, take my advice, only check rooms when you know someone should be in them. Most are locked for a reason. Some of the rooms haven't had patients in them for a long time. And stay away from the far corners of the floor, the staff says they've got a problem with vermin. Reggie stopped and looked directly at Daryl. Listen, just take it easy tonight. Follow your schedule and stay out of those empty rooms. Daryl nodded, watching Reggie step into the elevator. The doors closed, leaving Daryl to stare at his reflection in the shiny metal. Once Reggie was gone, Daryl went back to the reception desk. He wanted to find out who was in which room, so he picked up the patient log and made his way down the corridor again, this time alone. His curiosity was growing. He had heard a moaning sound twice already and had seen Reggie become defensive when he tried to investigate it. While reading the log, he realized that there was an error on the list. According to the log, all the rooms in the hall were supposed to be empty, but there were patients in some of them. Daryl wanted to double check what he had seen, so he cautiously approached the room that Reggie had warned him to stay away from. He opened the door and was met with the acrid smell of sickness, stronger than he had encountered earlier. The room was poorly lit, but Daryl's flashlight revealed a figure lying on a bed. The patient was a frail old woman, barely moving. Daryl stared at her, feeling a sense of pity and dread. Her eyes opened, and she looked at him, her mouth trembling as she tried to speak. Her voice was faint, almost drowned out by the whir of the machines surrounding her. Help me, she whispered. Daryl's heart raced as he stepped closer to the bed, unsure of what to do. Please, help me, she repeated, her voice strained and desperate. I'll get a nurse, Daryl stammered, backing away toward the door. But when he turned to leave, the door slammed shut on its own. He spun around, his flashlight flickering as the temperature in the room suddenly dropped. The woman's whisper became a low, guttural moan that seemed to echo throughout the room. Help me, she shrieked, her voice now distorted and inhuman. Terrified, Daryl bolted for the door, fumbling with the handle before it finally gave way. He burst out of the room and into the hallway, his mind racing. He could still hear the woman's moans echoing behind him as he fled down the corridor, past the empty rooms, and back to the safety of the reception desk. Daryl stood there, panting, trying to make sense of what had just happened. He glanced at the patient log, which still listed the room as empty. His thoughts raced. Was the hospital haunted? Were the nurses playing a trick on him? Daryl couldn't shake the feeling that something was very wrong on the 13th floor. Suddenly, the elevator doors opened, and a familiar figure stepped out. It was Reggie, but something about him was off. His eyes were cold and his expression was blank. I told you to stay out of those rooms, he said flatly, his voice devoid of the warmth he had shown earlier. Daryl froze, staring at Reggie in disbelief. What? What's going on here, he demanded, his voice trembling. Reggie walked slowly toward him, his eyes fixed on Daryl. You shouldn't have come here. You should have listened, he said, his voice unnervingly calm. Now you'll never leave. As Reggie reached out to grab him, Daryl felt a chill run down his spine. He turned and bolted for the elevator, smashing the button repeatedly until the doors finally closed. His heart pounded as he rode down to the lobby, praying that he would make it out of the hospital alive. When the doors opened, Daryl sprinted across the lobby and out into the night, not stopping until he was blocks away from the hospital. He gasped for breath, his mind reeling from the terror he had just experienced. 
Daryl knew he could never go back to that hospital, but he also knew that he would never be able to forget what he had seen on the 13th floor. My mom is superstitious. She has always adhered to silly, nonsensical rules like not stepping on cracks or tossing salt over her shoulder if you spill it rules that may or may not have any true origin or reason. These are things people follow blindly, even though we all know there are no consequences for breaking them. One of my earliest memories involves my mom nervously demanding I hold my breath until she says otherwise. I don't remember where we were coming home from late at night, but mom and dad were in the front seat, and I was in a car seat, half asleep. Suddenly she said urgently, Jason, hold your breath, she'd smack dad on the arm. You too, please. Just do it. Then she'd gulped in a big breath and held it as we traveled down the foggy night road. Once she released her breath and said, Okay, my dad laughed. He was used to her superstitions and normally just went along to make her happy. Why'd I have to hold my breath, mommy, I'd asked. Mom swiveled in her seat to look at me. Because we were getting ready to pass a graveyard. Didn't you see it? I hadn't seen it which I was glad about. It probably would have spooked me out. I shook my head. Well, anytime you pass a graveyard at night, you must hold your breath until you make it safely past. I frowned and wrinkled my nose. You do? Why? I asked. She gave me a serious look. Son, you just do, that's why. To be safe. That's why it's so important to always pay attention to your surroundings. Sometimes I think back to that and laugh a little. To think it's important to pay attention to your surroundings for the sole purpose of knowing when you're passing a graveyard. It's sort of funny. Do you know what it takes to get hired at a graveyard? Like as a job? Well, actually, in my case, it took exactly no effort. It took my dad drinking coffee with the city workers at the local diner on Sunday mornings and volunteering me when they said they needed a part-time groundskeeper. I didn't particularly care for the idea, but I did like money. And spring had come, so the weather was getting pretty nice. So I guess I didn't mind too much when I started working Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays after school, and Saturday mornings at our town's small cemetery. I'd go and prune bushes, pick up fallen tree limbs, cut the grass, and weed eat carefully around tombstones. I was a teenager but I was a pretty nice kid. I felt respectful of the place's residents, and I treated the grounds with proper reverence. I even came to enjoy the job. Sometimes when I came, there would have been a funeral earlier in the day. The casket would be lowered into the ground, and the mourners would be gone by the time I arrived. But the grave would be uncovered, with a pile of dirt still next to the chasm in the earth, waiting to be filled in. Or, I would arrive on a Saturday to find a grave or two dug, a deep, perfect rectangle, awaiting a funeral later in the day, yet to have a casket lowered in. I hated to admit it, but I always liked the smell of the freshly dug graves. It generated a natural, earthy scent. Sometimes I felt the graveyard smelled old and stale, and also a little like an old lady due to the mixture of flower arrangements both growing and wilting away. It was probably all in my head. I supposed it was normal to just think that a graveyard smelled odd because a graveyard was an odd place. Nonetheless, I liked the ageless smell of the freshly turned earth. I never saw anybody digging the graves. Month after month passed, and I never caught a glimpse of anyone doing it. I also wondered why the graves were left open after a funeral. Why didn't the gravedigger come and fill it in right away? It seemed sort of eerie and maybe a safety hazard. Normally I was alone in the graveyard during my short shifts, but once in a while I would cross paths with another city worker who'd come in on some errand or task. The guy who sort of ran the graveyard, if that's a thing, was a grumpy old guy who never had much to say. One Saturday morning, I asked him about the gravedigger. 
Hey George, I asked. How come you never see the person who digs the graves around here we were in a small office next to the main mausoleum? And George's eyes shot up from the stack of papers he was shuffling through. The kind of question is that he grunted. I shrugged. I dunno. Just curious, I guess George gave me a sharp look, staring at me for a second. He works at night, he finally barked. Oh, always. Like he never needs a night off to work in the day instead. He was glowering at me then. Boy, it's a job for the night time. Now, if you ain't got nothing to do, I reckon you can just skedaddle. From then on, I got sort of obsessed with the gravedigger. Thinking of it as a job that had to be done strictly at night made it all the more strange and alluring to me. Who was this person? What had drawn him to this sort of work? What was he like if he'd been spending a lot of time at night, all alone, digging graves? What did he look like? Why? Why on earth did he do this? I talked to my friend Jacob about it. I told him one day about all the open graves that popped up in the morning. What grouchy old George had told me about the night gravedigger and my general fascination with this person. Jacob stared at me blankly. Dude, you're nuts, I laughed. Seriously. I think working in the graveyard has gotten to you. I need to tell your parents to make you quit that job, I chuckled again. Nah, it's a surprisingly okay job. Nothing creepy or like crazy making has ever happened. I bugged out my eyes and lurched at him playfully. He ducked out of my way. Seriously, though, I continued. Don't you ever think about what certain jobs are like? Like being a garbage collector or an NFL football player? Uh, those are two really random selections, but yeah, I guess I kind of think a lot about law enforcement. I might like to go that route when I'm older. See, that's exactly what I mean. You think about jobs and wonder about what the job is like, and maybe about what sorts of people do certain jobs, right? Jacob shrugged. Yeah, I guess. Seems legit. So yeah, then you get what I'm saying. You're already thinking about a law enforcement career. What I want to know is, who wakes up one day and goes, boy, I really feel passionate about pursuing a career in the field of digging graves. Jacob cracked up laughing. Okay, yeah, I guess I see your point. So the guy never comes around except late at night? There's literally no way you could get to meet him, I don't think so. So I guess you have to go there at night then. I frowned. There is no way I could get out late at night unnoticed. And anyway, it's illegal to go into a cemetery past dark if you don't work there, dude. You do work there, Jacob informed, rolling his eyes. Well, I mean, it wouldn't be my time to work, so it wouldn't be okay for me to be there. And anyway, don't you think it might kind of freak him out if someone just showed up late at night Jacob thought about it for a minute? Well then, I guess your only option if you really wanted to get a look at this guy would be to install a camera, what I cried. Sure. Like a little motion-activated camera. Like a ring doorbell or something. Just put it somewhere that it most likely won't be noticed, and then it'll just kick on when someone moves near it. That sounds sort of stalkery, Jacob shrugged. You sound sort of stalkery, dude, wouldn't that be pretty sketch? Like, don't you think we could get in trouble for this, we Jacob asked with a laugh. I mean, I suppose you could get in trouble. But the trick would be to leave it somewhere low-key and then get rid of it once you're satisfied. And if someone finds it and bothers to trace who it belongs to, which they probably wouldn't, then you could just make up something about being worried about vandals and trying to do a community service. Wow. Great idea, I exclaimed. You have sort of a criminal mind for someone who wants to be a cop, hey? Well, maybe that'll make me an excellent cop. Within the next week, we had gotten hold of a small motion-activated camera and set it up to notify my phone when it was triggered. I happened to know that a funeral was scheduled for that Saturday, so I planted the camera where it would be triggered near the site of the new grave. 
Jacob planned to spend the night at my house so we could finally see this mysterious person. Everything seemed to be going according to plan. That night after my parents had gone to bed, we snuck to my room and stared intently at my phone, waiting for a notification. We must have fallen asleep because my phone startled us awake, buzzing violently. It's going off, Jacob shouted. I grabbed my phone and brought up the camera feed. We could see something faintly. Something was definitely moving, and then we could see a figure emerge into view. He wasn't terribly far from the camera, but we still couldn't make out his face. I'll try to enhance it, Jacob offered. He reached over me and tapped my phone. The screen brightened, and the camera zoomed in closer. Jacob and I sat and stared. The figure was bent over, doing something with the ground. The way he moved looked so strange. He wasn't using a shovel like I'd expected. He seemed to be clawing at the ground with his hands, digging vigorously. What's he doing, Jacob whispered. I don't know, I whispered back. He's not digging with a shovel, Jacob stated the obvious. I don't know why, I said, keeping my eyes glued to the screen. Suddenly the figure stopped digging and stood up straight and we could make out the rest of him. His hair was long and scraggly, and his clothes looked like they were torn and dusty. His eyes looked dark, even though he was standing a decent distance from the camera. He took a deep breath, stretching his mouth wide as he breathed in. Jacob and I looked at each other, freaked out but fascinated. Why is he doing that, Jacob asked, doing what I wanted to know, breathing in so deeply like that, Oh, maybe he's catching his breath. He's been digging for a while. We stared for a few more minutes as the figure went back to clawing at the ground. He was taking great swipes at it with his hands, and dirt was going everywhere. Suddenly, there was a dull thud and a loud screech from the phone. Ah, Jacob and I both cried. What was that? I exclaimed. I don't know, Jacob yelped. We stared back at the camera to see the figure was hunched over the grave again, and then he was reaching down to pick something up. He's holding something, I whispered. We leaned in closer to the screen. Is that I gasped, my voice sticking in my throat. That looks like I couldn't finish the sentence. Jacob was staring open-mouthed. The figure stood up again, this time holding up what looked like a long, thin rod. It took us a moment to realize what it was a bone. He held it up and looked at it, then slowly turned his head in our direction. He looked directly into the camera, and we could see his eyes glowing faintly in the dim light. Jacob and I both let out startled gasps and nearly dropped the phone. The figure started to move towards the camera, and we scrambled to turn it off. What is he doing, Jacob whispered frantically. I don't know, I whispered back. We have to go see Jacob urged. I shook my head. No way. That's crazy, come on, we have to go. We can't just leave him there. Jacob insisted. We grabbed our flashlights and hurried downstairs, trying to keep as quiet as possible so as not to wake my parents. We crept outside and made our way to the graveyard. As we approached the area where the camera was set up, we could see the figure in the distance. He was still standing near the open grave, holding the bone. We hesitated, unsure of what to do next. Should we call the police? I asked. No, let's just see what he does, Jacob replied. We watched as the figure slowly lowered the bone back into the grave and began to cover it with dirt. He moved with a slow, deliberate grace as if he was performing some kind of ritual. Once he was done, he stood up and looked around, seeming to take in the surroundings. Then, without warning, he turned and started walking towards us. We need to hide, Jacob whispered urgently. We ducked behind a nearby tree, trying to stay out of sight. The figure passed by, and we held our breath, hoping he wouldn't notice us. He continued walking, and we breathed a sigh of relief once he was out of sight. Let's get out of here, I whispered to Jacob. We made our way back home as quietly as possible, both of us shaken by what we had witnessed. 
The next day we went back to the graveyard to retrieve the camera. As we approached the area, we noticed that the grave was completely covered up and there was no sign of the figure. Do you think it was all just a dream? I asked Jacob. I don't know, he replied. But I think we should keep this to ourselves for now we agreed and went our separate ways, both of us unsure of what we had seen. From that day on, I couldn't help but feel a sense of unease whenever I passed by the graveyard. I couldn't shake the feeling that the gravedigger was still out there, watching and waiting. For the past couple of years, I've had the same job. I'm a janitor for a popular fast food restaurant. I don't take orders or do anything aside from cleaning. I don't even see other workers a lot of the time because I'm scheduled overnight. At the restaurant, everything needs to be deep cleaned every day, and during open hours, it's basically impossible to do. I'd never had anything happen during my shifts aside from the occasional customer knocking on the window asking if we're open. On this night, I came in and got to work like I usually did. A couple of other employees were still there when I got there, but by 10, which was an hour after closing, it was just me for the rest of the night. I popped in my headphones and started scraping the grills and prepping everything that needed to be hosed down. After a while, I lost track of time, but my best guess is that it was around 12 a.m. when I heard a knock at the front of the building. I pulled off my headphones, hearing it again. I walked to the front, expecting someone at the door wanting to see if we were closed, but when I looked, nobody was there. I went up to the door and looked out at the parking lot, no cars or people. I knew I'd heard it from this side of the building though, so I waited for it again, but there was nothing. I ended up thinking I just mistook another sound for knocking and went back to work. Another hour or so went by, and then I took a lunch break. I grabbed my lunch bag and sat at one of the tables in the middle of the dining area, taking my time since I was actually ahead on my cleaning. Once I finished eating, I went to the back and turned to grab the mop, only to see a man's face staring at me from outside the drive through window. He had messy hair and a blank face, but his eyes had something strange about them, like they were empty. I froze up for a second, and after a moment, the man calmly turned and walked away. My heart was racing in my chest, and I just stood in place, listening to his departing footsteps. I didn't know what to think, it was just incredibly creepy and strange. Once I got my confidence back, I opened the window and looked out to make sure he left. It was dark beyond the light of the restaurant but I didn't see anyone, so I closed it up and locked it. I was on edge for the next hour, constantly looking behind me at the windows, feeling like I was being watched. But as my shift was coming to an end, I started to feel some relief, and the anxiety calmed down. One of the last few things I had to do was roll all the garbage bags out to the dumpster, which I was avoiding as long as I could. I checked the window before I stepped out, and it looked clear so I quickly opened the door and got the garbage out. I started tossing them one by one into the dumpster, but not even 20 seconds in, the man appeared from around the corner. I stopped what I was doing and quickly asked what he needed. He didn't respond as he walked up to me and had that same empty stare. Now that I could see his whole body though, he was even more terrifying being a fairly large man and wearing a dirty and stained coat. Not knowing what else to do, I ran for the door. I opened it as the man's footsteps rushed up behind me, and as I slammed the door shut, the man was able to stick his arm into the gap, preventing it from closing. I turned and sprinted to the other end of the restaurant getting my keys out and unlocking the front door as fast as I could while hearing the man closing the distance on me. I barely got away and ran before he got to me. I sprinted across the parking lot and as far as I could while calling the police. Five minutes later, the police got to the restaurant. The man was gone. We got footage on the CCTVs, 
but no identity could be made of it. It also showed that as soon as I ran away, the man just stayed there and watched me for a bit, then left out the back door. What he wanted from me is unknown, but his creepy and objectively horrifying behavior gives me chills even to this day. I was working late at the office one night. We have a big two-story building in a business complex. And sometimes if we have to catch up on work, we kind of have to stay late. I had taken two sick days the week before, so I really had to get my project done and didn't have much time left to do it. I planned to stay a few hours this night and a few hours the next night to get caught up, leaving anywhere between 1 and 2 a.m. Often others would be there late as well. But this night it was just me. I was working at my desk, which was in the middle of a room full of desks. As I typed away on my laptop, I started to get a little drowsy. After fighting it for a bit, I got up to make some coffee in the break room. I started the machine and leaned against the table, barely keeping my eyes open as it slowly poured into the mug. A sudden thud shook me awake. It sounded like it was downstairs, but it was really loud, resonating through the whole building. Nothing followed the sound, though. It was just the one thud. I walked over to the doorway and looked out at the stairs, debating whether or not to see what it was. Honestly, I was so tired I thought it had to just be something falling in one of the rooms downstairs and chose not to investigate. I grabbed my mug and went back to my desk, continuing to work. I sat there for an hour non-stop working, but the coffee really wasn't fixing my sleepiness problem. I kept working, trying to power through it, but I was only prolonging the inevitable. At some point, I dozed off at my desk. When my eyes opened, I remember being immediately irritated and somewhat dizzy, like I had been annoyingly woken up from a deep sleep. As I regained my senses, I noticed a sound coming from somewhere in the building. It was a beep, sounding every four or five seconds, but very faint. I looked at my laptop. Seeing it was nearly 2 a.m., I decided it wasn't worth trying to work anymore. So I packed up my things and brought them with me as I left the room to both check on the beeping and to leave afterwards. As I got to the stairwell, the beeping started to make me nervous. I'd never heard it before, and there was something eerie about it. Maybe I was too tired before to fully comprehend it. I walked down the staircase, and now with the beeping much louder, I peered into the long main hallway. At the far end, there was a metal rod laying on the ground right in front of the open entrance door. I felt blood rush from my face, knowing it should be locked up and realizing the beeping was from the building's security system. With nothing but instinct to go off of, I ran to the opposite end of the hallway and out the back door, getting in my car to call for help. Although I was out of the building, what I learned next was far more terrifying. Police pulled in and searched around, not finding anyone or anything. When we checked the security cameras at 11 p.m., a man could be seen walking up and breaking the door open with a single hit from some kind of tool creating the bang sound that I heard while getting coffee. He then quietly moved around the first floor and up to the second, where he came into the office I was in and stood quietly only a few feet behind me while I was working at my desk. He then went back downstairs, coming up again while I was sleeping, and walked around the whole office, even going right up to me and searching around my desk. It's not clear if he stole anything, as there weren't cameras in every room, but there didn't seem to be any obvious answer as to what he was doing there. After seeing the security tapes, I've never stayed alone at that office again. I'm retired now, but for a couple of years in my 50s, I worked a night shift in a mall. I was a custodian, and would come in and clean once the mall had closed for the night. Most of my nights were spent cleaning up the food court areas, as well as taking care of bathrooms. 
One night I was sweeping the floor in the food court area, and I heard a fit of coughing coming from somewhere. I looked around the dimly lit food court area but didn't see anyone. A couple of times throughout my years working there, I would discover somebody or a group of people who had hidden in the mall and were doing a challenge of staying there overnight. I didn't see anyone and heard no further noises, so I just continued cleaning. If someone was trying to stay in the mall overnight, I'd see them eventually unless they stayed put in one spot the entire time. About 15 minutes had passed and I was wiping off tables. Suddenly a series of loud bangs startled me. I looked up and saw that a whole table and all the surrounding chairs had been knocked over onto the ground. I walked over to the items on the ground, which had happened near the edge of the food court. There was no one to be seen anywhere. I ventured down away from the food court a bit to see if I could see anyone running away or hiding. I was about to turn around back to the food court when I heard water running inside the women's bathroom. All the bathrooms at the mall had sinks that were motion sensors. Someone had to be inside of the bathroom, and I had a feeling that it was going to be the culprit I was looking for from the food court. The sink was still running as I slowly and as quietly as I could enter the bathroom. As I turned the corner into the bathroom, the water abruptly stopped running. There was nobody anywhere to be seen. I checked every stall and still nothing. I chalked it up to a faulty sensor on the sink and decided that I'd put in a work order for maintenance to fix it. Oddly enough, as I walked away from the bathroom, I heard the sink turn on again. I walked back to the food court very confused and also a little spooked. I went about the rest of my night as usual, finishing my cleaning duties. A couple of days later, I received an email from maintenance that there had been nothing wrong with the sink sensor and that it was functioning normally. From then on, at least once a week, I would hear the water running from the sink in that bathroom. For the rest of the time that I worked at the mall, I just accepted that I wasn't alone in that mall and stayed away from that bathroom. I never had any more incidents with the mysterious knocking over tables and chairs in the food court. Thankfully, that spirit or whatever it was stayed in the women's bathroom. I used to work night shift security, and by far the scariest thing I ever encountered was when I chanced upon a robbery in progress. I was patrolling one of our assets around the start of my shift at 10 p.m. walking around the perimeter of the building. Everything looked in order except an air conditioner near ground level that had fallen out of place. The air conditioner didn't fit well in the hole, so there had been a wooden plank to prop it up and keep it in place. I assumed that the stick had somehow been nudged and the AC unit had fallen out of place. It wasn't very heavy, so I propped the air conditioner back into its hole in the wall, positioning the stick to keep it in place. I continued my walk around the building, reaching the next window, and to my surprise, someone was there. The light in the room wasn't on, but there was a bit of light entering the room from the hallway that the office space was connected to. It wasn't uncommon for a worker to be working late on a project or either use their code to re-enter the building and grab something they had forgotten earlier. I pressed my face to the glass to see who it was and if I would recognize them. Once I was peering through the glass, I could make out that it definitely wasn't an office worker. The person was wearing a ski mask over their face. They noticed my face pressed up against the window and hustled out of the room. Realizing that a robbery was in progress, I quickly put two and two together, figuring out that the fallen air conditioning unit hole was most likely the way they had entered the building. I immediately pressed a button on my phone in an app that my company used to notify police if they needed to send cars to my location. I was still standing only about 100 feet away from the AC unit so I ran over to see if that was going to be how the perpetrator would attempt to escape. Sure enough, shortly after I had reached the AC unit, 
It came flying out at me as the intruder pushed it forcefully from inside. The AC unit was knocked straight backwards into my chest, and I watched as the person in the ski mask flew through the hole in the wall, barreling into me and the AC unit that I had somehow managed to catch. The suspect ran into a nearby neighborhood, but the police arrived soon after and had them cornered in a city block, shutting down the entire street and eventually capturing them. It felt good to say that I had stopped an attempted robbery in progress, but I'll never forget the image of the person flying through a dark hole in the wall directly into me. It was quite terrifying, and I had nightmares about it for the next couple of nights.